Welcome to Physics Inspired. I'm your instructor, Mr. Andrews, and today we want to answer the question, what causes an object to move? Well, to answer that question, you might say power. Power makes an object move. I have to put batteries in my remote control car, or I have to put gasoline in my real car. Those things supply my car with power. Without them, my car won't move. Well, you'd be on the right track. But we want to go to a deeper, more fundamental level about what makes an object move. Why is this even important in the first place? Well, movement is how we interact with our environment. Let's face it, if we couldn't move or move the things around us, life would be really difficult. Think about our bodies. What moves in our bodies? Our heart beats. Blood circulates. Lungs expand and contract. Without movement, life would be darn near impossible. So we celebrate life by discovering the things that make objects move. To even begin to answer this question, let's make sure that our foundation is set. And we want to make sure we understand first, well, what is an object? And also, what do we mean by movement? Let's start with the latter. We learned previously about a reference frame and its importance in defining a position. And we learned that the change from an initial position to a final position, well, that was called displacement. And usually that change happens over time. And so that is called velocity, the change in displacement over time. And even our velocity can change over time. And that change in velocity over time is called acceleration. And we learned that there were three ways that an object can accelerate. It can either speed up, the magnitude or amount of velocity could increase. It could either slow down, the magnitude or amount of velocity could decrease, or it could change directions. Those are three ways that an object could accelerate. And that's what we mean by movement. So by movement, we really mean accelerate. Okay, so then what about an object? What is an object? For our purposes, we're going to say this. We'll say that an object is anything that has mass. Well, what is mass? We don't mean what we go to church for. Uh, we don't mean one of the 50 states. What we mean by mass, we mean the amount of matter in an object. And we'll even clean that definition up a little bit better. So, our initial question, what makes an object move? Let's begin to recreate that and say, what causes a mass to accelerate? Suppose I have a file cabinet that I'm trying to move or accelerate. I can either do one of two things. I can either push my file cabinet or pull my file cabinet. That push or pull is what we'll define as a force. And we can even clean up that definition a little bit later. Okay, so there we have it. What causes an object to move? A force causes an object to move. It's either a push or pull on a mass, and that causes an object to move. All right, so let's think about this again. <clears throat> let's try to clean up our definition of mass just a little bit. Let's say now I have my file cabinet, and I also have a folding chair. If I apply the same force or same amount of force on each of those, if I push them in the same amount, which is going to be easier to accelerate? Which is going to be harder? The easier one is going to be the folding chair. Absolutely correct. The harder one is going to be the file cabinet. Why? Because the file cabinet has more mass. It's massive. It's more, it has more matter compared to the chair. So, let's see if we can change our definition of mass just a little bit. We can say that mass is the tendency of an object to resist acceleration in the presence of a force. Remember, acceleration is what we, what we mean by movement. Right? So now we have a definition of mass, and now well, we can even have a better definition of force as well. A force is going to be that which causes an object to accelerate. All right. So those are our two definitions. Now we know what makes an object move, forces, and we also know what an object is. An object is anything that has mass. All right, let's move on to the next. 
See you in a minute. Previously, we looked at forces and we tried to answer the question, what causes an object to move? Before we even did that though, we had to first establish what movement was in the first place, what is an object. So let's pick up there with a short recap and then we'll move forward. Well again, what is movement? We learned that movement really equals acceleration. That's what we're talking about. And we learned that there were three ways that an object can accelerate. It can either speed up, slow down, or change directions. And then the next question we asked, well, what is an object? And we said that an object is going to be anything that has mass. Well, what was mass? Mass was going to be the amount of matter in an object. And anything can be an object. Anything that we can perceive. Some examples include maybe a basketball, molecules, or even a pen. Anything that we can perceive in our physical world. The next question we asked, well, then what was mass? And we said that, well, it's the amount of matter, but we wanted to come up with a better definition of that. And so we said that mass was the tendency of an object to resist acceleration in the presence of a force. So, for instance, if I had a mountain and I tried to push on a mountain, chances are that mountain is not going to move. Why? Because the mountain is massive. Not only is the mountain big, but the mountain is massive as well. So massive mountains are hard to move. They resist acceleration. The next question then was, well, what is a force? And the force we said it was anything that causes a mass to accelerate. The force is a vector, and it's measured in newtons. One newton, symbolized by n, is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. Now, there are two types of forces. There are contact forces and field forces. Let's take a look at both of them. Contact forces are forces that result from the physical contact between two or more objects. For instance, boxing. Boxing is an exchange of contact forces. Field forces, on the other hand, are forces that act through space. An example of field forces are gravity and magnetism. There are a lot of forces that may act on an object, and this can get very complicated when we're trying to analyze them. So to make it simpler, we'll draw a free body diagram. And a free body diagram is just an illustration that helps to simplify the forces that interact on an object. A free body diagram is nothing more than a drawing that illustrates how forces interact on an object. For instance, an airplane has four forces that interact on it. Lift, drag, weight, and thrust. If we quantify those forces and give them values, then we can draw a free body diagram that shows our object and how our forces interact with it. Now again, many forces may be acting on one object, but the only thing that really counts is the net force. And the net force is the resultant of all those other forces on the object. So if we have more than one force on our object, we can simplify that by just showing the net force on our object. Again, objects may have many forces, but only the net force counts. If the net force is zero on an object, then the acceleration is zero, and our object will either remain moving with a constant velocity or it may be at rest if it wasn't moving at all. The object is said to be in equilibrium. What is equilibrium? <laughs> well, just that. 
Equilibrium is the state of an object when it's at rest or when it's moving with a constant velocity. The net force on it is zero. It doesn't mean that there are no forces on the object. It just means that the net force, the sum or resultant of all the forces, is equal to zero. So now, let's try to put all this into practice and determine the net force on our object. Remember, our net force is a vector, so it has a magnitude and direction. Here are some simple steps for determining the net force. Let's take our plane for example. First, we want to determine all the forces in the x and y directions. Then, we want to add the forces in each direction. Next, we want to find the resultant of the force in the x and y directions. And lastly, we want to determine the angular direction of the airplane. All right, here we are. There's our free body diagram. So let's do step one. We're going to determine all the forces in the x and y direction. In the x direction, I have 400 newtons in the positive direction and 100 newtons in the negative direction. And in the y direction, I have 300 newtons going up in a positive direction and 100 newtons going down in a negative direction. Step two. Now we're going to add all the forces in each direction. So in the x direction, I have 400 newtons plus a negative 100 newtons equals a total of 300 newtons. And in the y direction, I have 300 newtons plus negative 100 newtons for a total of 200 newtons. Now, I have to find the resultant of the forces in the x and y direction. How do I do that? I use the Pythagorean theorem. So I'll square my x forces and I'll square my y forces and add them together and take the square root. So the resultant magnitude of the force is 360 newtons. In my direction, we can find my direction by taking the inverse tangent of my opposite side over my adjacent side, and I get 33.7 degrees. So this sums up our introduction to forces. We still have a little more to go, but we'll get there eventually. Alright, I'll see you next time.